Welcome to the 11th installment in a reading of Madame Bovary. If you enjoy these readings, it would be great if you could consider subscribing and perhaps even click that like button. In doing so, you would greatly help me. I am deeply grateful for your support. And now, part three, chapter two. On reaching the inn, Madame Bovary was surprised not to see the diligence. Hiver, who had waited for her fifty-three minutes, had at last started. Yet nothing forced her to go, but she had given her word that she would return that same evening. Moreover, Charles expected her, and in her heart she felt already that cowardly docility that is for some women at once the chastisement and atonement of adultery. She packed her box quickly, paid her bill, took a cab in the yard, hurrying on the driver, urging him on, every moment inquiring about the time and the miles traversed. He succeeded in catching up the hirondelle as it neared the first houses of Queen Campois. Hardly was she seated in her corner that she closed her eyes and opened them at the foot of the hill when from afar she recognized Felicité, who was on the lookout in front of the farrier's shop. Hiver pulled in his horses, and the servant, climbing up to the window, said mysteriously, Madame, you must go at once to Monsieur Homais. It's for something important. The village was silent as usual. At the corner of the streets were small pink heaps that smoked in the air. For this was the time for jam-making, and everyone at Yonville prepared his supply on the same day. But in front of the chemist's shop one might admire a far larger heap, and that surpassed the others with the superiority that a laboratory must have over ordinary stores. A general need over individual fancy. She went in. The large armchair was upset, and even the Fanal de Rouen lay on the ground, outspread between two pestles. She pushed open the lobby door, and in the middle of the kitchen, amid brown jars full of pickled currants, of powdered sugar and lump sugar, of the scales on the table, and of the pans on the fire, she saw all the omets, small and large, with aprons reaching to the chins and with forks in the hands. Justin was standing up with bowed head, and the chemist was screaming. Who told you to go and fetch it in the cafanium? What is it? What is the matter? What is it? replied the druggist. We are making preserves. They are simmering, but they were about to boil over, because there is too much juice, and I ordered another pan. Then he, from indolence, from laziness, went and took, hanging on its nail in my laboratory, the key of the cafanium. It was thus the druggist called a small room under the leads, full of the utensils and the goods of his trade. He often spent long hours there alone labeling, decanting, and doing up again, and he looked upon it not as a simple store, but as a veritable sanctuary, whence there afterwards issued, elaborated by his hands, all sorts of pills, ball uses, infusions, lotions, and potions that would bear far and wide his celebrity. No one in the world set foot there, and he respected it so that he swept it himself. Finally, if the pharmacy, open to all commas, was the spot where he displayed his pride, the cafanium, 
was the refuge where, egotistically concentrating himself, Ome delighted in the exercise of his predilections, so that Justin's thoughtlessness seemed to him a monstrous piece of irreverence, and, rather than currents, he repeated, Yes, from the Cephanium. The key that locks up the acids and the caustic alkalis. To go and get a spare pan, a pan with a lid, and that I shall perhaps never use. Everything is of importance in the delicate operations of our art. But, devil take it, one must make distinctions and not employ for almost domestic purposes that which is meant for pharmaceutical. It is as if one were to carve a fowl with a scalpel, as if a magistrate. Now be calm, said Madame Homais, and Athalie, pulling at his coat, cried, Papa, Papa. No, let me alone, went on the druggist, let me alone, hang it, my word, one might as well set up for a grocer, that's it, go it, respect nothing, break, smash, let loose the leeches, burn the mellow paste, pickle the gherkins in the window jars, tear up the bandages. I thought you had, said Emma. Presently, do you know to what you expose yourself? Didn't you see anything in the corner, on the left, on the third shelf? Speak, answer, articulate something. I don't know, stammered the young fellow. Ah, you don't know? Well, then, I do know. You saw a bottle of blue glass sealed with yellow wax that contains a white powder on which I have even written dangerous. And do you know what is in it? Arsenic. And you go and touch it. You take a pan that was next to it. Next to it, cried Madame Homais, clasping her hands. Arsenic, you might have poisoned us all. And the children began howling as if they already had frightful pains in their entrails. Or oh, poison a patient, continued the druggist. Do you want to see me in the prisoner stock with criminals in a court of justice? Do you see me dragged to the scaffold? Don't you know what care I take in managing things, although I am so thoroughly used to it? Often I am horrified myself when I think of my responsibility, for the government persecutes us, and the absurd legislation that rules us is a veritable Damocles' sword over our heads. Emma no longer dreamed of asking what they wanted her for, and the druggist went on in breathless phrases. That is your return for all the kindness we have shown you. That is how you recompense me for the really paternal care that I lavish on you. For without me, where would you be? What would you be doing? Who provides you with food, education, clothes, and all the means of figuring one day? with honor in the ranks of society. But you must pull hard at the oar if you're to do that, and get, as people say, callosities upon your hands. Fabricando fit faber, age quod agis. The worker lives by working, do what he will. He was so exasperated, he quoted Latin. He would have called it Chinese or Greenlandish had he known those two languages, for he was in one of those crises in which the whole soul shows indistinctly what it contains, like the ocean, which, in the storm, opens itself from the seaweeds on its shores down to the sands of its abysses. And he went on. I am beginning to repent terribly of having taken you up. I should certainly have done better to have left you to rot in your poverty and the dirt in which you were born. Oh, you'll never be fit for anything but to herd animals with horns. You've no aptitude for science. You hardly know how to stick on a label, and there you are, 
dwelling with me snug as a parson, living in clover, taking your ease. But Emma, turning to Madame Homais, I was told to come here. Oh, dear me, interrupted the good woman with a sad air. How am I to tell you? It is a misfortune. She could not finish. The druggist was thundering. Empty it, clean it, take it back, be quick. And seizing Justin by the collar of his blouse, he shook a book out of his pocket. The lad stooped, but Omey was the quicker, and having picked up the volume, contemplated it with staring eyes and open mouth. Conjugal love, he said, slowly separating the two words. Ha ha, very good, very good, very pretty, and illustrations. Oh, this is too much. Madame Omey came forward. No, do not touch it. And the children wanted to look at the pictures. Leave the room, he said imperiously, and went out. First, he walked up and down with the open volume in his hand, rolling his eyes, choking, tumid, apoplectic. Then he kept straight to his pupil, and planting himself in front of him with crossed arms. Have you every vice, then, little wretch? Take care, you are on a downward path. Did not you reflect that this infamous book might fall in the hands of my children? Kindle a spark in their minds, tarnish the purity of Athalie, corrupt Napoleon? He is already formed like a man. Are you quite sure, anyhow, that they have not read it? Can you certify to me? But really, sir, said Emma, you wish to tell me. Ah, yes, madame, your father-in-law is dead. In fact, Monsieur Bovary Senior had expired the evening before, suddenly from an attack of apoplexy as he got up from table and by way of greater precaution, an account of Emma's sensibility, Charles had begged Omey to break the horrible news to her gradually. Omey had thought over his speech. He had rounded, polished it, made it rhythmical. It was a masterpiece of prudence and transitions, of subtle turns and delicacy. But anger had got the better of rhetoric. Emma, giving up all chance of hearing any details, left the pharmacy. For Monsieur Omey had taken up the thread of his vituperations. However, he was growing calmer, and was now grumbling in a paternal tone whilst he fanned himself with his skullcap. It is not that I entirely disapprove of the work. Its author was a doctor. There are certain scientific points in it that it is not ill a man should know, and I would even venture to say that a man must know. But later, later, at any rate, not till you are a man yourself and your temperament is formed. When Emma knocked at the door, Charles, who was waiting for her, came forward with open arms and said to her with tears in his voice, Ah! My dear, and he bent over her gently to kiss her. But at the contact of his lips, the memory of the other seized her, and she passed her hand over her face, shuddering. But she made answer, Yes, I know, I know. He showed her the letter in which his mother told the event without any sentimental hypocrisy. She only regretted her husband had not received the consolations of religion, and he had died at Dotville, in the street, at the door of a café after a patriotic dinner with some ex-officers. Emma gave him back the letter. Then at dinner, for appearance's sake, she affected a certain repugnance. But as he urged her to try, she resolutely began eating, while Charles opposite her sat motionless in a dejected attitude. 
Now and then he raised his head and gave her a long look full of distress. Once he sighed, I should have liked to see him again. She was silent, at last, understanding that she must say something. How old was your father? she asked. Fifty-eight. Ah, and that was all. A quarter of an hour after, he added, My poor mother, what will become of her now? She made a gesture that signified she did not know. Seeing her so taciturn, Charles imagined her much affected, and forced himself to say something, not to reawaken the sorrow which moved him. And shaking off his own, Did you enjoy yourself yesterday? he asked. Yes. When the cloth was removed, Bovary did not rise, nor did Emma. And she looked at him. The monotony of the spectacle drove little by little all pity from her heart. He seemed to her paltry, weak, a cipher. In a word, a poor thing in every way. How to get rid of him? What an interminable evening. Something stupefying like the fumes of opium seized her. They heard in the passage the sharp noise of a wooden lake on the boards. It was Hippolyte bringing back Emma's luggage. In order to put it down, he described painfully a quarter of a circle with his stump. He doesn't even remember any more about it, she thought, looking at the poor devil whose coarse red hair was wet with perspiration. Bovary was searching at the bottom of his purse for a centime, and without appearing to understand all there was of humiliation for him in the mere presence of this man, who stood there like a personified reproach to his incurable incapacity. Hello, you have a pretty bouquet, he said noticing Lyon's violets on the chimney. Yes, she replied indifferently. It's a bouquet I bought just now from a beggar. Charles picked up the flowers, and freshening his eyes, red with tears against them, smelt them delicately. She took them quickly from his hand and put them in a glass of water. The next day, Madame Bovary Sr. arrived. She and her son wept much. Emma, on the pretext of giving orders, disappeared. The following day they had a talk over the morning. They went and sat down with their workboxes by the waterside under the arbor. Charles was thinking of his father and was surprised to feel so much affection for this man whom till then he had thought he cared little about. Madame Bovary Senior was thinking of her husband. The worst days of the past seemed enviable to her. All was forgotten beneath the instinctive regret of such a long habit, and from time to time, whilst she sewed, a big tear rolled along her nose and hung suspended there a moment. Emma was thinking that it was scarcely forty-eight hours since they had been together, far from the world, all in a frenzy of joy, and not having eyes enough to gaze upon each other. She tried to recall the slightest detail of that past day, but the presence of her husband and mother-in-law worried her. She would have liked to hear nothing, to see nothing so as not to disturb the meditation on her love, that, do what she would, became lost in external sensations. She was unpicking the lining of a dress, and the strips were scattered around her. Madame Bovary Senior was plying her scissor without looking up, and Charles, in his list slippers, and his brown surtout that he used as a dressing gown sat with both hands in his pockets, and did not speak either. Near them, Bert, in a little white pinafore, 
was raking sand in the walks with her spade. Suddenly she saw Monsieur Lurieux, the line draper, come in through the gate. He came to offer his services, under the sad circumstances. Emma answered that she thought she could do without. A shopkeeper was not to be beaten. I beg your pardon, he said, but I should like to have a private talk with you. Then, in a low voice, it's about that affair, you know. Charles crimsoned to his ears. Oh, yes, certainly. And in his confusion, turning to his wife, Couldn't you, my darling? She seemed to understand him, for she rose. And Charles said to his mother, oh, It is nothing particular. No doubt some household trifle. He did not want her to know the story of the bill, fearing her reproaches. As soon as they were alone, Monsieur Laurier, in sufficiently clear terms, began to congratulate Emma on her inheritance, then to talk of indifferent matters, of the espalier, of the harvest, and of his own health, which was always so-so, always having ups and downs. In fact, he had to work devilish hard, although he didn't make enough, in spite of all people said, to find butter for his bread. Emma let him talk on. She had bored herself so prodigiously the last two days. And so you're quite well again, he went on. Ma foi, I saw your husband in a sad state. He's a good fellow, though we did have a little misunderstanding. She asked what misunderstanding, for Charles had said nothing of the dispute about the goods supplied to her. Why, you, you know well enough, cried Larrier. It was about the little fancies, the traveling trunks. He had drawn his hat over his eyes and his hands behind his back, smiling and whistling. He looked straight at her in an unbearable manner. Did he suspect anything? She was lost in all kinds of apprehensions. At last, however, he went on. We made it up, all the same, and I've come again to propose another arrangement. This was to renew the bill Beaufort had signed. The doctor, of course, would do as he pleased. He was not to trouble himself, especially just now, when he would have a lot to worry. And he would do better to give it over to someone else. To you, for example. With the power of attorney, it could be easily managed. And then we, you and I, would have our little business transactions together. She did not understand. He was silent. Then, passing to his trade, though he declared that Madame must require something, he would send her a black barrage, twelve yards, just enough to make a gown. The one you have on is good enough for the house, but you want another for calls. I saw that the very moment that I came in, I have the eye of an American. He did not send the stuff. He brought it. Then he came again to measure it. He came again on other pretexts, always trying to make himself agreeable, useful, in fiefing himself, as Omey would have said, and always dropping some hint to Emma about the power of attorney. He never mentioned Bill. She did not think of it. Charles, at the beginning of her convalescence, had suddenly said something about it to her, but so many emotions had passed through her head that she no longer remembered it. Besides, she took care not to talk of any money questions. Madame Bovary seemed surprised at this, and attributed the change in her ways to the religious sentiments she had contracted during her illness. But as soon as he was gone, Emma greatly astounded Bovary by her practical good sense. It would be necessary to make inquiries, to look into mortgages, 
and see if there were any occasion for a sale by auction or liquidation. She called the technical terms casually, pronounced the grand words of order, the future, foresight, and constantly exaggerated the difficulties of settling his father's affairs so much and that at last one day she showed him the rough draft of a power of attorney to manage and administer his business. Arranged all loans, signed and endorsed all bills, all sums, etc. She had profited by Lerieux's lessons. Charles naively asked her where this paper came from. Monsieur Guillaume, and with the utmost coolness she added, I don't trust him over much. Notaries have such a bad reputation. Perhaps we ought to consult. We only know no one. Unless Lyon, replied Charles, who was reflecting. But it was difficult to explain matters by letter. Then she offered to make the journey, but he thanked her. She insisted. It was quite a contest of mutual consideration. At last, she cried with affected waywardness, No, I will go. How good you are, he said, kissing her forehead. The next morning, she set out in the hirondelle to go to Rouen to consult Monsieur de Lyon, and she stayed there three days. Part 3, Chapter 3 They were three full, exquisite days, a true honeymoon. They were at the Hotel de Boulogne, on the harbour, and they lived there with drawn blinds and closed doors, with flowers on the floor, and iced syrups were brought to them early in the morning. Towards evening they took a covered boat and went to dine on one of the islands. It was the time when one hears by the side of the dockyard the cocking mallets sounding against the hull of vessels. The smoke of the tar rose up between the trees. There were large fatty drops on the water, undulating in the purple color of the sun like floating plaques of Florentine bronze. They rode down in the midst of moored boats, whose long, oblique cables grazed lightly against the bottom of the boat. The din of the town gradually grew distant, the rolling of carriages, the tumult of voices, the yelping of dogs on the decks of vessels. She took off her bonnet, and they landed on their island. They sat down in the low-ceilinged room of a tavern, at whose door hung black nets. They ate fried smelts, cream, and cherries. They lay down upon the grass. They kissed behind the poplars, and they would fain, like two Robinsons, have lived forever in this little place which seemed to them in their beatitude the most magnificent on earth. It was not the first time that they had seen trees, a blue sky, meadows, that they had heard the water flowing and the wind blowing in the leaves. But no doubt they had never admired all this, as if nature had not existed before, or had only begun to be beautiful since the gratification of their desires. At night they returned, and the boat glided along the shores of the islands. They sat at the bottom, both hidden by the shade, in silence. The square oars rang in the iron thwarts, and in the stillness seemed to mark time, like the beating of a metronome, while at the stern the rudder that trailed behind never ceased its gentle splash against the water. Once the moon rose, they did not fail to make fine phrases, finding the orb melancholy and full of poetry. She even began to sing, One night, do you remember, we were sailing, 
etc. Her musical but weak voice died away along the ways, and the winds carried off the trills that Leon heard pass like the flapping of wings about him. She was opposite him, leaning against the partition of the shallop, through one of whose raised blinds the moon streamed in. Her black dress, whose drapery spread out like a fan, made her seem more slender, taller. Her head was raised, her hands clasped, her eyes turned towards heaven. At times, the shadow of the willows hid her completely. Then she reappeared suddenly, like a vision in the moonlight. Leon, on the floor by her side, found under his hand a ribbon of scarlet silk. The boatman looked at it, and last said, Perhaps it belongs to the party I took out the other day. A lot of jolly folk, gentlemen and ladies, with cakes, champagne, cornets, everything in style. There was one especially, a tall, handsome man with small moustaches, who was that funny. And they all kept saying, Now tell us something, Adolf. Adolf, I think. She shivered. You are in pain? asked Leon, coming closer to her. Oh, it's nothing. No doubt it is only the night air. And who doesn't want for women either? softly added the sailor, thinking he was paying the stranger a compliment. Then, spitting on his hands, he took the oars again. Yet they had to part. The adieu were sad. He was to send his letters to Mayor Olay, and she gave him such precise instructions about the double envelope that he admired greatly her amorous astuteness. So you can assure me it is all right, she said with her last kiss. Yes, certainly. But why, he thought afterwards, as he came back through the streets alone, is she so very anxious to get this power of attorney? Part 3 Chapter 4 Leon soon put on an air of superiority before his comrades, avoided the company, and completely neglected his work. He waited for her letters, he read them, he wrote to her, he called her to mind with all the strength of his desires and of his memories. Instead of lessening with absence, this longing to see her again grew, so that at last, on Saturday morning, he escaped from his office. When, from the summit of the hill, he saw in the valley below the church spire with its tin flag swinging in the wind, he felt that the light mingled with triumphant vanity an egotistic tenderness that millionaires must experience when they come back to their native village. He went rambling around her house. A light was burning in the kitchen. He watched for her shadow behind the curtains, but nothing appeared. Mère Lefossois, when she saw him, uttered many exclamations. She thought he had grown and was thinner while Artemis, on the contrary, thought him stouter and darker. He dined in the little room as of yore, but alone without the tax-gatherer. For Binet, tired of waiting for the hirondelle, had definitely put forward his meal one hour, and now he dined punctually at five, and yet he declared usually the rickety old concern was late. Leon, however, made up his mind and knocked at the doctor's door. Madame was in her room and did not come down for a quarter of an hour. The doctor seemed delighted to see him, but he never stirred out that evening, nor all the next day. He saw her alone in the evening, very late, behind the garden in the lane. In the lane as she had the other one. It was a stormy night, and they talked under an umbrella by lightning flashes. 
The separation was becoming intolerable. I would rather die, said Emma. She was writhing in his arms, weeping. Adieu, adieu. When shall I see you again? They came back again to embrace once more, and it was then that she promised him to find soon, by no matter what means, a regular opportunity for seeing one another, in freedom, at least once a week. Emma never doubted she should be able to do this. Besides, she was full of hope. Some money was coming to her. On the strength of it, she bought a pair of yellow curtains with large stripes for her room, whose cheapness Monsieur Lerieu had commended. She dreamed of getting a carpet, and Lerieu declaring that it wasn't drinking the sea politely undertook to supply her with one. She could no longer do without his services. Twenty times a day she sent for him, and he at once put by his business without a murmur. People could not understand either why Merlet breakfasted with her every day and even paid her private visits. It was about this time, that is to say, the beginning of winter, that she seemed seized with great musical fervor. One evening, when Charles was listening to her, she began the same piece four times over, each time with much vexation, while he, not noticing any difference, cried, Bravo! Very good! You're wrong to stop! Go on! Oh no, it is execrable! My fingers are quite rusty! The next day he begged her to play him something again. Very well, to please you. And Charles confessed she had gone off a little. She played wrong notes and blundered. Then, stopping short, Ah, it is no use. I ought to take some lessons, but... She bit her lips and added, Twenty-four lessons. That's too dear. Uh, yes, so it is, rather, said Charles, giggling stupidly. But it seems to me that one might be able to do it for less, for there are artists of no reputation, and who are often better than the celebrities. Find them, said Emma. The next day, when he came home, he looked at her shyly, and at last could no longer keep back the words. How obstinate you are sometimes. I went to Barfouchere today. Well, Madame Ligard assured me, that her three young ladies, who are at La Misericorde, have lessons at fifty sous apiece, and that from an excellent mistress. She shrugged her shoulders and did not open her piano again, but when she passed by it, if Bovary were there, she sighed. Ah, uh, my poor piano. And when anyone came to see her, she did not fail to inform them. She had given up music, and could not begin again now for important reasons. Then people commiserated her. What a pity! She had so much talent. They even spoke to Bovary about it. They put him to shame, and especially the chemist. You are wrong. One should never let any of the faculties of nature lie fallow. Besides, just think, my good friend, that by inducing madame to study, you are economizing on the subsequent musical education of your child. For my own part, I think that mothers ought themselves to instruct their children. That is an idea of Rousseau's. Still rather new, perhaps, but that will end by triumphing. I am certain of it, like mothers nursing their own children and vaccination. So... Charles returned once more to this question of the piano. Emma replied bitterly that it would be better to sell it. This poor piano, that had given her vanity so much satisfaction. To see it go was to Bovary like the indefinable suicide of a part of herself. If you liked, he said, a lesson from time to time, that wouldn't, after all, be very ruinous. But lessons, she replied, are only of use when followed up. 
And thus it was she set about obtaining her husband's permission to go to town once a week to see her lover. At the end of a month she was even considered to have made considerable progress.